Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow, and in today's video, we'll go through the main points of the final three sections of Chapter 6 from Wolfson. In Section 6.3, we will go over how integration allows us to compute the work done by a variable force. In Section 6.4, we'll introduce the concept of kinetic energy and present the work energy theorem. And finally, we'll end the chapter with a discussion of power, which turns out to be the time derivative of work. And the quote above from Richard Wolfson is, humankind's rate of energy consumption is a matter of concern, especially given our dependence on fossil fuels whose carbon dioxide emission threaten global climate, climate change. The pie chart shows the relative sources of total energy consumption in Canada in 2008. In total, 66% of energy consumed by Canadians in 2008 came from non-renewable fossil fuels. That will have to change in the coming decades as a result of both limited fossil fuel resources and the environmental consequences of fossil fuel combustion, especially climate change. So, in the last section, we learned how to compute work done by a constant force. But what if the force changes as it is applied? If the motion is confined to the x-axis, then to consider the work done, you have to make a plot of the x component of the force versus the x position of the object. For a variable force, you might get some kind of smooth curve like this one. Now, any smooth curve can be approximated by a set of straight lines. Along one of these straight lines, the force is approximately constant. And the work done by a constant force is the force times the displacement. And graphically, force here is the height of these green rectangles, and displacement is the width. Height times width is the area of the rectangle. So, graphically, the area of each of these rectangles is approximately the work done by the force over that small delta x. Next, if you want to get more precise, the trick is to make the rectangles narrower and use more of them. You can imagine that if you had millions of tall skinny rectangles like this, the sum of the areas of all these rectangles would be very close to the area of the actual curvy shape. And this area would be the total work done by the force over the total distance. So that's it. The exact value for the work done by the force is the area under the force versus position curve. And the next thing I'm going to tell you is that the area under a curved line like this is called an integral. So work is the integral of force over a distance. Okay, so what's integration? Integration is a concept from calculus, and a lot of people think of it as the opposite of differentiation. Now I realize there's a good chance that you haven't really done much integration in your calculus course yet, but believe me, it's not that difficult. Let's go over the basics. The definite integral is the result of the limiting process in which the area is divided into ever smaller regions, just like we did in the previous slides. Work, as the integral of the force over position x, is written as w equals the integral from x1 to x2 of f of x dx. x1 and x2 are called the limits. This curvy s thing is called an integral sign. And f of x is called the integrand. This dx at the end is called the differential, which just reminds you what the little rectangle widths are that you are summing up. 
And since integration is the opposite of differentiation, if you know how to differentiate something, like a polynomial, for example, then it's pretty easy to figure out how to integrate it. You just have to make sure that if you take the derivative of your integral, you get back to the original function. So, looking at this, it says that the integral of x to the n dx is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Now, if you differentiate that, if you differentiate that d by dx of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, you uh, multiply by n plus 1, and then you uh, subtract 1, so it's x to the n plus 1 minus 1, um, all over n plus 1. These n plus 1s cancel, and you get x to the n. So you're back to x to the n. So that's the integral. Now this straight line right here reminds you to plug the limits x1 and x2 into this result and subtract. Plug in the last limit and then you subtract the, the final limit to get the total area between the limits. Okay, let's do an example of integrating a variable force to get work. Consider a spring which is attached to a wall at the left end and a movable mass on the right end. We define x to be the position of the mass, with x equals 0 being the point where the spring is in equilibrium, so there is no force on the mass. If the mass moves to the left, x is negative, and if it moves to the right, x is positive. And if the spring is not stretched too much, we know that the force it exerts on the mass is given by Hooke's law. f spring equals negative k times x, where k is the spring constant. But if you are an outside agent trying to move the mass slowly, you must balance this spring force by applying a force which is equal to plus k times x. We call this doing work against the spring. The work done by this agent as the mass travels from 0 to x is the integral of f of x dx, which is the in integral of k times x dx. Now this is a polynomial with n equals 1. The result is 1 half k x squared. Subtracting the limits of x and 0, you get that the work done against the spring is 1 half k x squared. Graphically, this is the area under the triangular force versus distance curve given by Hooke's law. In the case of doing work on the spring, the force starts at zero and goes up to k times x at the end. The base of this triangle is x and the height is k times x. The area of a triangle is one half base times height, which again is one half k times x squared. This is called the, a geometric method of evaluating a simple integral, which can be a handy technique. Now if we have multiple dimensions, like if you're going along a path from point A to point B, the integral for the work becomes a line integral, where we define this little differential displacement dr as being a vector. So for every little step you take, the scalar product of f dot dr and you integrate from our initial position a to our final position b. Let's think about the work done against gravity. Now the force of gravity is always down. If there is an agent pushing an object up a hill, there must be an upward component of the external forces and this upward component is doing work against gravity. 
In the case of this car going up the hill, energy in the engine is being used up to rotate the tires. And because of that rotation, there's, there are external forces of the road on the car. And if the car is not accelerating, that external force has an upward component which balances the downward gravity. So it's equal to mg. The work done by this upward component over the displacement delta r is just mg times the upward component of delta r, delta y. And if you define the total displacement, the y displacement to be the height of the hill, h, then the work done by the road on the car against gravity is mg times h, or mgh. Again, the work done by an agent lifting an object of mass m against gravity is m times g times h. The work is positive if the object is raised and negative if it's lowered. Keep this in mind because in the next chapter, this equation will come up again when we define gravitational potential energy. Now keep in mind that the work you do in moving an object only involves the force that you apply, but there may be other forces acting on the object as well. The net work is the work done by all the forces acting on the object. That is, the work done by the net force. Since a net force leads to an acceleration, the net work always changes the speed of an object. If you apply Newton's second law, F net equals m times a to an object, you can derive something called the work energy theorem. W net is the integral of m times a dx, where a is the acceleration, which is the time derivative of the velocity v. If we rearrange these differentials, this becomes an integral over, d, over v of m times v. If you integrate from some initial velocity v1 to a final velocity v2, this is the integral of a polynomial with n equals 1, and you get 1 half m times v squared. Plugging in the limits, and you get the net work equals 1 half m v2 squared minus 1 half m v1 squared. So the quantity 1 half mv squared changes only when net work is done on an object, and the change in this quantity is equal to the net work. This leads us to define a new quantity called kinetic energy using this equation. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. It depends on the mass of the object and the square of the speed. We will call this quantity k. And there's that equation we derived in the previous slide. K equals 1 half mv squared. The basic idea is that if this car is going twice as fast, it has four times as much kinetic energy. So, our work energy theorem now looks like this. The change in the kinetic energy is equal to the net work. Okay. The last section of this chapter is on power. Power is a measure of how fast work is done. You need a lot of power to lift this rocket up into the air for two reasons. One is that you're doing work against gravity, mgh, and the other is that the rocket is speeding up, so the kinetic energy is increasing. And all of this is happening in a very short amount of time. In equation form, power equals the work done divided by the time interval over which this work was done. So, if the same amount of work is done in a shorter time interval, the power is greater. The SI unit of power is joules per second. In physics, this unit has been given its own special name, the Watt. This is named after James Watt, the developer of the steam engine. So, one joule per second equals one Watt. And of course, one kilowatt equals 1,000 watts. 
An example of power is that you use more power running up the stairs than you would climbing the same stairs more slowly. Another example, let's think about outboard engines on boats. The power output of an engine is often given in a non-SI unit called horsepower. One horsepower is defined as 746 watts. So here are two 300 horsepower engines and here are two 150 horsepower engines. So a 300 horsepower engine can do twice the work of a 150 horsepower engine in the same amount of time, i.e. it could push a bigger boat. Or a 300 horsepower engine could do the same amount of work as a 150 horsepower engine in half the time, i.e. it could push the same size boat twice as fast. That's why water skiers like to have engines with a lot of power, so they can go faster. This leads us to the relationship between the power used up by pushing an object and the speed of that object. The infinitesimal work, dw, done by a constant force acting on an object that undergoes an infinitesimal displacement, dr, is f dot dr, where f is the force applied to the object. If you divide both sides of this equation by the differential dt, the left side becomes the power, dw by dt. The right side becomes the constant force dot producted with dr by dt, which is the velocity. So writing this in terms of velocity, v power equals f dot v. Now let's do a quick example. Riding your nine kilogram bicycle at a steady 4.4 meters per second, you experience an 8.2 Newton force from air resistance. If your mass is 66 kilograms, what power must you supply? Okay, so let's draw this bicycle and list our knowns. The mass is nine kilograms and the velocity is 4.4 meters per second is constant. And there is a backwards force of air resistance of 8.2 newtons. So if the velocity is constant, the bike is not accelerating. So the net force must be zero. That means the cyclist must be supplying a forward force which works against air resistance and balances the forces. So let's draw that force here as F equals 8.2 newtons forward in the same direction as the constant velocity V. Now the question is asking, what is the power provided by that force? So we just use the equation we derived on the previous slide for power, P equals F dot V. Since F and V are in the same direction, the dot product is just the product of their magnitudes. P equals 8.2 times 4.4, which equals 36.08. We can write the final answer to two significant figures. Power equals 36 watts.